Welcome back, my friends, to part two, the conclusion of our exciting look at the biblical events of the future in the return of Jesus Christ in the temple of Ezekiel's prophecy. My name is Peter Wisnowski, and we ask that you stay with us for the next half hour to join us in our discussion on the amazing soon fulfillment of Bible prophecy as we delve into the scriptures of God and consider the exciting events soon to come to pass. Thank you for joining us. Indeed, Scripture makes it very clear that God wants us to be informed. God wants us to see the big picture, His big picture. He wants us to be aware of the exciting events that are going to happen. He wants us to be familiar with the scenario of the future, to look forward to what's coming. Indeed, to be familiar with the promises indeed of the joy of the future as opposed to the warnings that he also presents in scripture and remember as that old saying goes to be forewarned is to be forearmed in a quote from the old testament we see the scripture say in the book of proverbs that where there is no vision the people perish but he that keepeth the law happy is he so, as we said, God wants us to see the big picture. Sometimes we get a little bit too involved in some of the finer details, which is acceptable, which is fine, which is what God wants. But he wants us to see the big picture, to stand back and to see the forest instead of just detailing the trees. God wants us to look at the future where there is unlimited joy and the hope of God's kingdom. There was a man like this. One man had such a vision. He was the illustrious king of Israel, King David, a man after God's own heart. And this is what he had to say. This is his quote from Psalm 27. One thing have I desired of the Lord, that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. Now, King David yearned for this time of peace, for a, a time of restoration, as it were, a time of tranquility. But we know that David had only times of trouble. David had primarily times of tribulation. He had trial from the heathen enemy as a warrior. He had trial from an enemy king of his own people. He had trials from within his own family, amongst his own friends, and even from the poor decision-making that he did when he let his own desires take over. Indeed, he never got to visit God's temple. As a matter of fact, the temple of God didn't even exist, and he wasn't even allowed to build it. It was not until his son, Solomon, after David had died, but not before, he'd already prepared the materials for this coming temple that God gave him the blueprints to design that only Solomon, a man of peace is what his name means, that only Solomon were allowed to build this temple. David never inquired of this literal temple. He never saw it. David will have to wait some more. Not for 3,000 years will David ever see this. This is an artist, as a matter of fact, not only an artist, but an architect's impression of the latter chapters of Ezekiel of the glorious temple that shall be designed and built by God and his people this is the future of Ezekiel's temple's prophecy and you notice that there's such glorious dimensions to this place and even in the place that it will be built we know that this will be the center of the earth according to God the apple of God's eye the city of the great king. When this temple was first given in vision to the prophet Ezekiel, God through an angel said this, set thine heart. And the man said unto me, son of man, behold with thine eyes, hear with thine ears, and set thine heart upon all that I shall show thee, for to the intent 
that I might show them unto thee art thou brought hither. Declare all that thou seest to the house of Israel. Ezekiel was to make this presentation to his people, a people that will be fit and chosen, and God saw to it whether or not they did. In the next slide, it continues on. Thou son of man, show the house to the house of Israel, that they may be ashamed of their iniquities, and let them measure the pattern. And if they be ashamed of all that they have done, show them the form of the house, and the fashion thereof, and the goings out thereof, and the comings in thereof, and all the forms thereof, and all the ordinances thereof, and all the forms thereof, and all the laws thereof. Friends, there is so much detail that God wants Ezekiel to focus on and relay that information of that detail to this wonderful house of the future that it is given in a blueprint's design in the latter chapters of the prophecy of Ezekiel. Indeed, it's a, a prophecy associated with a fulfillment of turning away from their iniquities. You see how there's a reward involved to see this temple if they turn away from their iniquities. Israel, unfortunately, never turned away from their iniquities. And so this house that's been waiting in vision, in prophetic utterances from Scripture, is still there waiting in the future. But there was only one man that could see to it, that had the right to build this house, greater than Solomon, greater than David. And that man will be returning in the near future. And here it continues. Ezekiel is telling them, specifically, write it in their sight, that they may keep the whole form thereof, and all the ordinances thereof, and do them. This is the law of the house. Upon the top of the mountain, the whole limit thereof round about shall be most holy. Behold, this is the law of the house. If you look at the last ten chapters or so of the prophecy of Ezekiel, it is describing a temple in such exquisite detail that no man, no great architects over the centuries have ever been able to even conjure. They could not consider such an extraordinary building, not only in size, but as well in beauty, in form, in diversity, in the mixing of elements that were structures that were built in amongst natural settings. There will never be another house. There has never been another temple such as this. In the next slide, we can see a little bit of the detail of this architect, only replicating what he saw in his expertise of this glorious house. And, and if you look carefully, you'll see carved figures of the cherubim, which throughout Scripture are representatives of God's glory. You can see the scale. If you look closely, these wonderful little joyous people that are guests in this beautiful, glorious temple. You can see the scale, the height of the arches, and these aren't even the most highest of the edifices in this coming temple. We're told, and it says again in Ezekiel, to mark well. God rarely says things like this. He's repeating it over and over. Pay attention. It's like your teacher, the first day of class, saying, listen to what I'm about to say. This will be on your exam. Let's read it from Ezekiel. Then brought he me the way of the north gate before the house, and I looked, and behold, the glory of the Lord filled the house of the Lord, and I fell upon my face. And the Lord said unto me, Son of man, mark well. Behold with thine eyes, and hear with thine ears all that I say unto thee, concerning all the ordinances of the Lord, and all the laws thereof. And mark well the entering in of the house, with every going forth of the sanctuary. Notice that, that it is repeated for emphasis, that we see time and time again that God is preparing a glorious future building for all the saints in the future. Will we be a part of that? The Lord Jesus Christ knew exactly what was coming. He was familiar with Scripture. But before any architect creates a building, what does he do first? 
He sits down. He draws up the plans. And as importantly, he also chooses a site whereby he can place this beautiful edifice. He chooses the place where he's going to put it, and it is needing to be to his exact formulations. In this next slide, it talks about the preparatory change of topography that will occur in the future, as has been prophesied, as we mentioned, in the first part of the return of the Lord Jesus Christ and the discussion of this future temple. We know that, according to Zechariah, there will have to be such a change that God will have to level the land, but raise up the specific site of this great temple at which the pinnacle will show forth the divinely designed altar. And this will be, as, as Bible students can well note, a modification, a restoration of the law of Moses. And this will not be just simply for the Jewish people that says all nations shall flow unto it. There should be a great earthquake that will have to cause this to happen. Now we can go back into the Old Testament prophecy and we will shortly. We're going to look again at the prophecy of Zechariah. In the second last book of the Old Testament, in the last chapter, there is one of the most amazing scenario of events that are played out in this great cataclysm of the ages. And we're going to look at it with some detail with the little time that we have. Remember how in part one we talked about the return of Christ. We looked at that he would return to this specific mountain. Now, does anybody in the audience know where was the last place that the Lord Jesus Christ actually stood upon the earth? Now, if you looked at Acts chapter 1, you're going to see that he stood at the Mount of Olives, which is just east of Jerusalem. The last place that he stood, we're going to revisit. Let's take a look. Zechariah 14. Behold, the day of the Lord cometh, and thy spoil shall be divided in the midst of thee. For I will gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle. And the city shall be taken, and the houses rifled, the women ravished, and half of the city shall go forth into captivity, and the residue of the people shall not be cut off from the city. Then the Lord shall go forth and fight against those nations as when he fought in the day of battle. It continues. And his feet, his feet, shall stand in the day upon the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem on the east, and the Mount of Olives shall cleave in the midst thereof, toward the east and toward the west, and there shall be a very great valley and half of the mountain shall remove toward the north, and half of it toward the south. And in the final slide it says, And ye shall flee to the valley of the mountains, for the valley of the mountains shall reach Azal. Yea, ye shall flee like as he fled from the earthquake in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah. And the Lord my God shall come, and all the saints with thee. Friends, what this is saying in just a, a short amount of verses is God is planning to intervene in the full-scale assault of these confederate nations that will attack Israel in the last days. Anti-Semitism will have reared its ugly head for the last time. The Jews need to be rescued from this great holocaust that will come upon them, and they will be allowed to escape those who survive. All nations have never attacked Israel simultaneously. They will do so in the latter days. Israel for all of its great victories in war, she will at last be defeated. It will be a great day of mourning. But when things seem darkest and the clouds are the thickest, that is when the Lord God of Israel reacts to the destruction of his people. And he will turn around. He will send him whose name is blessed, for he comes in the name of the Lord, and he shall rescue his people. Israel's Messiah, whom they have yet to admit that they even know his name. They will be expecting someone, but they won't be expecting the man that Zechariah talks about as the man who will be wounded because of his friends. Friends, these immortal beings that we said at the last are the saints, the almighty, righteously rewarded immortals that will be given eternal life and be allowed to go into battle 
with the Lord Jesus Christ against the heathen who have attacked his people and that there will be no army that will be able to stand in their way. And just in case anybody's thinking, oh, how great can this earthquake be? Well, it's making a comparison to a lesser earthquake but was also a great earthquake in the days of a prophet named Amos. We'll just look at the next slide and it says, the words of Amos, a prophet of the Old Testament, who was among the herdmen of Tekoa, when he, which he saw concerning Israel in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah, and in the days of Jeroboam, the son of Joash, king of Israel, two years before the earthquake. Zechariah makes a direct reference to an already occurred real earthquake, powerful enough to be remembered in times past that this earthquake that is to come will put the other one in pale insignificance. The earthquake that is coming upon this earth shall so affect the whole earth that the, the people who are seismologists and who have done studies of earthquakes have shown that all the tectonic plates that are lined up that will be connected to the, the rift valley that runs right throughout Israel, right through Jerusalem, will affect the entire planet. When the Lord Jesus Christ returns to the earth, the whole world will know of it. They will see the cataclysm. They will realize that there's been a, something supernatural that has happened, and an edict will be uttered from Mount Zion soon thereafter. In the prophecy of Zechariah, we see one after the other. Read it at your leisure in its entirety, in detail, but this one chapter shows us right from the beginning there will be a supernatural light that follows the saints. Of course, this is God's intervention through his Lord Jesus, our Lord Jesus Christ, that will see to it that amazing series of events that will upstage and turn over the conflict that will be ultimately to the escape and, and the, the saving of Israel. A supernatural light will follow them. There's no need for the sun. There's no need for the light of the moon. This will be a supernatural light that will follow Christ and the saints. An eerie light to her enemies and a glorious light to those who are rescued. There will be, as we've mentioned, a topographical change. The land will go flat from this earthquake, except what stands upright, the great Mount Zion that should be established above the mountains and raised above the hills, and all nations shall flow unto it. Great geographical change. The prophecy of Zechariah continues in Jerusalem's rescue. It says that they will dwell safely. After all these cataclysms of war, of destruction, of pillaging and looting and killing, and after the great natural disasters that have occurred, there will be great safety for the people of Israel. There will also be plague and warfare. There will be a destruction upon those who have attacked Israel. There will be a plague that befalls them that is utterly supernatural, a type of death that God sends, and it, and it says it in detail, that they will die before they even hit the ground. The enemies of God will be absolutely shattered upon the mountains of Israel. And then, ultimately, as we see, an ultimatum of both good and evil. And if you were offered this, if you were those of the armies that have surrounded Jerusalem and have been decimated, the choice is pretty obvious. But some people will not choose the right way. It says that there will be a feast or a famine, that the nations who have gone against Israel are given an edict come up to Jerusalem and keep the Mount of Ol at, at the Mount of Olives the Feast of Tabernacles, which was an ancient Jewish festival of joy, of outdoor uh, fellowship and worship. And it will be a wonderful offer, not just to the Jews anymore, but also to the, the nations, the Gentiles, the survivors of the nations. God is saying, I've won victory over you. I will allow you now to come forth and, and bring about uh, worship for the true God, or if they do not, they receive no rain. How do you think those who are suffering drought will react? Future worship will occur involved with this Feast of Tabernacles that the Jews still celebrate to a mild extent. There will be animal sacrifice in the age to come just like it was in the days of Moses, and there will be a, a righteous and humane way of mankind being given the, the blessings of heaven. Indeed, the Feast of Booths 
is something that will be reinstituted. As we see in the next slide, it was mentioned in Leviticus chapter 23, but it's also mentioned in, in Matthew chapter 17. Interestingly enough, that was the Mount of Transfiguration that show that when Peter thought that Moses and Elijah are certainly here, we must be seeing some kind of second coming. The Messiah's kingdom is being established. And though it was in vision, it was not yet literally yet. It was not quite. And Peter, the first thing from his mouth, being somewhat confused, saying, Lord, it's good that we are here. Let us build three booths, one for you, one for Elijah, one for Moses. Indeed, Peter knew that the reinstigation of the Feast of Tabernacles, or booths, shall occur at the second coming. Peter knew that. And we ask, why do we not? In, in this lovely, beautiful vision, this idyllic paradise that should be restored, you can see it as the enemies of God, as something being very austere, or you can see it as those that are saying, I want to be a part of that glorious kingdom, to visit that temple, like David, to inquire at the house of the Lord and dwell in his temple. Indeed, those of the future that do God's will will enjoy all the blessings of paradise, of Eden restored. We remember this, do we not? The next slide we have from Mark chapter 11. It says, And they came to Jerusalem, and Jesus went into the temple, and began to cast them out, who sold and bought in the temple, and overthrew the tables of the money changers, and the seats of them that sold doves, it would not suffer that any should carry any vessel through the temple. And he taught, saying unto them, Is it not written, My house shall be called of all nations the house of prayer? But ye have made it a den of thieves. And, and what did the Lord Jesus Christ do? We know this from Sunday school. He drove them out. He made whips and made such a crashing noise and upset and turned the tables over of the money changers. He said, It is a house of prayer for all nations. Did this ever happen? My friends, it soon will. For indeed, what does the Old Testament say? In Isaiah chapter 56, and the next slide says, Also the sons of the stranger that join themselves to the Lord to serve him and to love the name of the Lord, to be his servants. Everyone that keepeth the Sabbath from polluting it and taketh hold of my covenant, even them will I bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices shall be accepted upon my altar. For mine house shall be called an house of prayer. For who? For all nations. Indeed, it is the Lord Jesus Christ that makes sure that this will be fulfilled. As a matter of fact, Christ has called several things. One of them is, according to the Old Testament prophecies, the branch. In the next slide, it says that he's after the order of Melchizedek. And speak unto him, saying, Thus speaketh the Lord of hosts, saying, Behold the man whose name is the branch, and he shall grow up out of his place, and he shall build, what? The temple of the Lord. Even he shall build the temple of the Lord, and he shall bear the glory, and he shall sit and rule upon his throne, and he shall be a priest upon his throne. And this is just like Melchizedek. Priest, king, and the council of peace shall be between them both. And, uh, as it says, the branch. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will perform that good thing which I have promised unto the house of Israel and to the house of Judah. In those days and at that time will I cause the branch of righteousness to grow up unto David. He is in the lineage of King David. There is none other than the Lord Jesus Christ. And he shall execute judgment and righteousness in the land. In those days shall Judah be saved and Jerusalem shall dwell safely. And this is the name wherewith the Lord, that she shall be called the Lord our righteousness. For thus saith the Lord, David shall never want a man to sit upon the throne of the house of Israel. It continues, neither shall the priests, the Levites, want a man before me to offer burnt offerings and to do sacrifice continually. And the word of the Lord came unto Jeremiah, saying, Thus saith the Lord, if you can break my covenant of the day and my covenant of the night, that there should not be day and, not, and night in their season, then may also my covenant be broken with David, my servant, that he should not have a son to reign upon his throne, and with the Levites, the priests, my ministers. That's a lot of information. We really hope that you can do your homework and look these up yourself. What this is basically saying, that if there's a man on this earth that would dare think that he could change the pattern of the earth going around the sun, or that the moon would not give its light, then only then could man say that a king will never reign in Israel, and that the high priest shall never minister over God's temple. Friends, 
the most exciting things are yet to happen on this earth. And just briefly, the two most detailed descriptions in all of Scripture were because of the tabernacle, the first floating temple of Scripture, and the second was Solomon's temple. Both were physical structures, and both were sites of sacrifice and worship. These days are coming. Friends, we know that we're running out of time. We ask that you get a hold of us, get in contact with us, and we'll go into this in a lot more detail when we have time. Please give us a call. We of the Christadelphia seat you to be ready for the return of our Lord Jesus Christ from heaven. We ask that all of you continue in your study of his word. Thank you.